Okay, so <laughs> my talk today is going to be on something called the principles of ownership. Um, this is based on a book called Extreme Ownership by Jocko Willink and Leif Baven. Has anybody heard or, of that book or read the book at all? <laughs> the TED talk is really, really good um, and it's thoroughly worth watching and downloading the book after this. So what my plan was for this talk is to go through a few of the principles and stuff that they say and how they relate to us as software development and teams and leaders. Because without thinking about it, we are all actually leaders in our own rights. That's where I'm going to kind of start off. So leadership is the greatest factor in any team's performance. Whether a team succeeds or fails is up to the leader. The leader's attitude sets a tone for the entire team. The leader drives performance or doesn't. This is a really, really powerful quote from the book. And it really highlights the fact that as a leader, we can either make the team succeed or we have the ability to make really, really good people fail. And that's obviously something we don't want to do. So what do we mean when we say the team? Well, your team is a collection of high caliber, three thinking, and multi-talented individuals. But as we are, we're all humans, so we're going to make mistakes. We're going to do things in unexpected ways. So how do we, as leaders, help our teams succeed? Because ultimately, that's what we're there to do. First of all, we're going to talk about belief. Um, Belief comes in three different ways. They, ultimately, your team must believe in the cause that they're going for. So if you're working for, say, a financial company and you don't believe in playing the stock market or something like that, you're not going to be as motivated to do your job well. Next, you need to be invested in the plan that your leaders are setting out to you. So the CEO at the top has got to give his leaders the right plan and make sure that they understand the plan. If they don't understand the plan, they're not going to execute the plan. And most importantly, they must believe in the leader that they're following. If you're going to follow Ronald McDonald down the street, and he said, I've got this new great business idea, would you really believe him? I probably wouldn't. So it comes down to the mentality. Anything that the people at the top do or any leaders do, is going to replicate down the chain of command, as in the military speak, all the way through down to your most junior person. So if you're not turning up for meetings on time, you're not being prepared for meetings, the junior people in your team are also not going to follow that example. So they're going to replicate your behavior. So it's really important for us to set a good example, and then the rest of the team will follow by that mentality. But most importantly, we need to remove all ego from the situation. So we can't just go around and say, I don't like this idea, so we're not going to do it. We have to take all the facts that are available to us and make the best decision possible. And any feedback that we get, there's a couple of ways that we can help people do the feedback. First of all, we've got to make feedback a conversation. So we can't go around to people and, and just essentially say, that's rubbish, don't do that. We need to get them involved in, in the conversation and say, okay, so why did you do it that way? What was your thought process behind it? And try and understand where they're coming from. And you need to do this quite early on. So there's no point in waiting until, say, the end of your sprint to give all the <coughs> feedback if you've seen a design flaw in the first two days. The earlier you can have that feedback, the better the end result is going to be. And most importantly, again, make sure this feedback is in private because different people will react different ways to having the feedback given to them. And you don't want to create any kind of discourse in your team by having public feedback. So try and keep it private as much as possible. So this is another great quote that is in the book. And it's on any team, in any organization, responsibility for the success or failure of the team rests with the leader kind of links back uh, to the first quote that I mentioned in the sense that there is one theme throughout the book. You really need to be a great leader uh, in order for your team to succeed. So this means that you know, if your team succeeds, you don't stand there and take all the plaudits. You let 
your team take that as well. So as I mentioned earlier, whether you realize it or not, you are a leader. So you might not have the title of leader in your, t in your job title, but within your team, you are actually a leader. And leaders must own everything in their world. There is no one else to blame. So if you, if you and your team didn't execute the plan from the CEO correctly, did you understand your plan from the CEO correctly? Did you replicate that down to your team? Did you ensure that they understand it? Did you get feedback from them to say, essentially repeat it and say, yes, this is what we're going to do. This is why we're doing it. But it's important for us not to micromanage every single aspect of the team. We need to give the team a framework to operate in. So whether it be you can use technology X, Y, and Z, or A, B, and C, any other choices, come and ask me. Let the teams be creative in what they want to do. You need to empower the junior leaders to make the decisions. So as technical leads, you might have two or three senior developers underneath you. You need to empower them to make the choices on the ground because you can't be there for every single decision. And sometimes even the most junior person on your team is going to come up to you with an absolutely amazing idea that you just wouldn't have thought of. Because remember back to what I said earlier about your team. You've got a multitude of talent from different aspects of life. They're going to have different experiences. And as leaders, we can utilize that to get the best end goal. One thing we all always need to do is make sure we're communicating well. If we have poor communication, then we're not really going to have a really effective team. We need to communicate to our superiors and to the people below us to make sure that everybody understands what it is we're doing, why we're trying to do it. Again, going back to that belief and that mentality. But when you're communicating your plan, you've also got to explain why. So you might not be able to go into Azure, for example, because of budgetary reasons or security compliance or something else. But if you turn around to your team and just say, no, you can't do that, they're going to think, OK, why not? So you really need to explain why you can't have a certain thing. And in much in the way that Agile and Sprint sprints kind of work, you do something, or you plan it, you do it, you review it. Have that constant cycle going around, and you will end up with a more effective team. And when I heard this quote, it was really, really interesting, and something that I kind of didn't think about before. So if you think back to your first programming job, what was the guy, guy or girl? Um, what were they like that was mentoring you? Were they a good programmer? Were they practicing with best practices, with clean code? Um, were they trying to teach you all the right stuff or were they just, yeah, I'm just gonna let you get on with this on day one and let me know if you've got any problems. So how we mentor of the junior people in our team ultimately affects what the team mentality is going to be like going forward. So if you can teach the most junior person in your team all the best principles of communication, of the skill, technical skills that they need, they're going to replicate that within the team themselves and then become a great leader themselves. Last of all, I'm going to finish off with a very, very quick story um, from the book. And this story can basically be summed up as there's no such thing as bad teams, only bad leaders. So how many people are familiar with kind of the US Navy SEALs and they have got something called Hell Week? Has people heard of that before? Um, in it, they basically get a big gigantic boat, um, it's part, they're called boat crews, and they run over sand dunes, run it into the water, swim for God knows how long, tip it over and then take it all the way back. And during this, there was one team that were consistently outperforming absolutely everybody else, um, boat six. And um, boat two were consistently losing all the time. And Jocko and Leif stood to one side and they were chatting with each other and they're going, I wonder what would happen if we switched the leaders round? What, what would happen to the two teams? You would surely expect 
then nothing to be happened. Or so it's, they tested this hypothesis and they switched over boat crew six and two. And to their surprise, boat crew two started winning absolutely everything. But boat crew six, because of the mentality that their leader had already brought into their team, were consistently second or third in every single race that they did. Now, the only thing that changed in between the two things was the leader. The boat crew stayed the same. It was just the leaders that changed. And Jocko and Leif put this down to that the leader of boat crew six that moved across to boat crew two were led from the front and wasn't complaining about anything. He wasn't trying to pass off poor performance on the teammates, wasn't shouting at them, etc., etc. Whereas boat crew the good leader out of the story, he was leading from the front, he was taking the hardest job and he was making sure he led from the front. So that kind of wraps up this like 10 minute lightning talk. Um, thank you very much for listening. There'll be a short changeover whilst we get the next laptop hooked up. Um, if you've got any questions or anything, I'll just double check now. Almost forgot myself. Yes, Tommy, you are in the right lecture. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Would I rather fight one John Skeet sized duck or a hundred duck sized John Skeet? <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll take the one John Skeet, to be honest. <laughs> um, what about managing upwards? What if upwards doesn't listen or change or if they do listen? Um, so if your upline doesn't want to listen, um, that can be a bit of a problem. But generally what will happen is they will keep asking questions. Why do you want to do this? Why do you want to do that? Um, and the way to get around that is to supply them all, all the information. And then next time they are gonna ask a similar question, make sure you supply that information in the first instance so they don't have to answer that question. Um, there's a very good scenario in the book that explains that exact situation. Um, so I thoroughly worth recommend like spending the nine pound or whatever it is to download the Kindle and read the book um, to find out the full explanation of it. But basically it evolves around just making sure you're consistently supplying the management with all the information that they need to make the decision. And then they will start trusting you and not allowing you to make the decision because that's what they want to do. It's whether they have the information to do that in the end.